Hello, and welcome to Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Hello, tribe, and happy Feast of Trumpets. Been reading this week through Romans, especially the first part of Romans. I'll be honest, a lot of times when I go back and look at Romans, I'll read like 5 through 9. It's been a while since I probably read in its entirety Romans chapter 1. You talk about a chapter that speaks to today's time and culture. Go back and read Romans chapter 1. But we're going to talk a little bit about and start in Romans chapter 2. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. But the doers of the law will be justified. Keep in mind, this is Romans. This is not Leviticus or Exodus. This is Romans. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having a law, are a law to themselves who show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I'm going to read a part of that again. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. There will be a day. It is written, there will be a day. When you're at the end. And you will stand before the judgment seat. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. If we look at Romans 14, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. And if we skip to Philippians 2.10, That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. One day we will give an account. We will stand before the judgment seat. And nothing... Nothing is secret to God. This is not the only place this is laid out. This is just a part that I was reading earlier this week that got me thinking about this. In that day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Nothing is secret to God. It may be a secret to other men. You may have things that nobody else knows. You may have secrets. The person next to you may have secrets from each other, from the world. But nothing is secret to God. God is all-knowing. He knows more than you do about yourself. And things you've forgotten about yourself. He knows. He knows every hair on your head. The Bible says, I bet you don't know how many hairs are on your head. I sure don't. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. There is no secret to God. From Hebrews 4, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom we are accountable. No secrets from God. You're not keeping any secrets from God. Even your thoughts, even your deepest thoughts, God knows them. God knows all thoughts and intents of the heart. A couple of verses that illustrate this. Just just a few, not an exhaustive list. But, Then here in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive and act, and render to each according to all his ways. Whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. 
I also, in my studying this week, by God's grace, was reading in Samuel. And this passage stuck out to me. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Psalm 7. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. And not that I should really need to back that up with so many verses, because if you believe in an all-knowing God, all-knowing is all-encompassing. That means all. That means your thoughts, your heart, your intent. I don't often mention the bio, but I was a police officer. I was a LAPD for quite a while. And uh, a lot of that, as you might surmise, was studying the law. For many laws, you had to show intent. For instance, it's the difference between, let's say, manslaughter or negligence and homicide. For instance, theft, if I remember from the penal code verbatim, and it was years and years ago, but the aspiration of personal property with the intent to permanently deprive the owner. The intent to deprive the owner. If a man walking along comes upon a handsome looking wristwatch puts it in his pocket and walks away is that theft well if he intends to keep it it's theft if he knows that's john smith's wristwatch and john smith works at abc title and loan down the street and he puts it in his pocket and brings it to john smith at abc title and loan then it's not theft because he didn't have the intent to permanently deprive the owner in fact he's keeping the law As in Deuteronomy 22, You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you or you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. And you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's which he loses, and you find. You may not ignore it. So the mere act of somebody walking along and picking up a wristwatch and putting it in their pocket is not. It's a sin if it's stealing. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. The action of him taking and putting it in his pocket, it's not theft without the intent. And you may be able to fool other people. You may be able to fool a judge. You may be able to fool a police officer because they aren't going to be able to perfectly be able to ascertain intent all the time. That's why it is also written in the law by the testimony of two or three witnesses. We see Paul saying this. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. But even our best attempts at earthly justice are not always 100% correct because we're flawed, infallible, biased human beings. You can fool a cop. You can get away with stuff. You can even fool really good friends. You could fool everybody in your life. But you're never going to fool God. God knows all acts and intents of the heart. It's not the appearance of a thing shouldn't be worried about how man sees it. God doesn't see as man sees. God sees the heart. I remember uh, studying history. There's a period called the Gilded Age. If you know gilding, it's where you just take an object that's less valuable and cover it with a precious metal like gold. It's gilded. It looks like it's gold, but it's just a thin veneer. Inside, it's something less It's just a thin veneer. Obviously, if you can't inspect it any deeper than the surface, 
It looks like gold to you, gilding does. But if you could perfectly examine the inner and the outer, you would see what the substance of the thing was. Well, God can, perfectly. Nothing is hidden before God. Jesus, he says, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He says, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. And he even, like, I would say, in my common modern day vernacular, he doubles down on it. Especially when he talks about, well, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 5, we'll start in verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will, be, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We'll come back to that, I think. Continuing, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way, with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That Jesus is showing here the intent of the heart matters. You can fool everybody around you. It is written, you shall not covet, right? That's the commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Coveting. It's a sin. You've heard that it says, do not commit adultery. Yeah, don't commit adultery. But also, don't covet. Don't look lustfully at your neighbor's wife. Jesus demonstrates very clearly here, your thoughts and intents of the heart, they matter. They matter, and you're accountable for them, even if nobody knows. God knows. Nobody could know that, not even the woman you're lusting after. You could be coveting that woman, and it's a sin, and God knows. I said I go back to that verse for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't rail on the Pharisees for keeping the law. He rails against them for adding to or taking away parts of the law, which is in and of itself breaking the law. It is written, you shall not add to it or take away from it. 
which is something the Pharisees were doing because Jesus says that and he doesn't lie. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Your righteousness had better exceed. He calls them hypocrites. They say and do not do. He says, what they teach you, that you should do. But what they do, don't do. Because they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And you might be thinking, well, the gospel, where's the good news? Yeah, there's good news. You might be thinking, well, I have some pretty evil thoughts, some pretty sinful thoughts. And I'd say, yeah. Yeah, me too, brother. Or sister. Good thing we don't earn our way to heaven by being a good person. For it is written, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even if, even if the whole world thinks, oh, you're such a good person. If everybody is constantly praising you for being so good and so righteous, you know the truth about you. You know your thoughts and intents of the heart. You know they're not all righteous and just and good and pure. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Talking about the good news. It's not about you. It's about God. It's not about how good you are. It's about how good He is. It's not about your strength, your ability. It's about God's. We started off in Romans. Let's look a little bit further in Romans. One of the most beautiful passages to me. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, if you don't know. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? The ungodly. Satan will come, he's called the accuser, and he will accuse you of being ungodly. He's taking a focus away from God and making you focus on you. And you know that you're not perfect. He's shifting focus where it doesn't belong. Not everything's about you. The world doesn't revolve around you. And your salvation does not depend on your goodness. Your salvation rests on Christ's goodness. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the un godly. When Satan comes accusing you saying you are ungodly, yeah, I am ungodly. It's a good thing Christ died for me. I like how this starts too. For when we were still without strength, without strength. Talking about without strength, what's more without strength than being dead? If you go to Ephesians 2, and you, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, he made you alive. It's not about you, it's about him. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, what a beautiful God we serve. I can just grope at and convey in my limited understanding in words the beauty and power and majesty and love of God. I could never conceive of a plan as beautiful as God's to save sinners where a God can be perfectly just and punish sin but 
perfectly loving and merciful to save a sinner like me. As it is written, to the Jews a stumbling blocks and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are saved. It's the wisdom of God and the power of God. Unlike all the other false pagan religions where humans were created to serve God and work for God and to do this for God and to do that for God and to sacrifice for God, the true, real God is so much better than those false, garbage, pagan deities. This is how beautiful God is, that he made us ex nihilo, out of nothing. He didn't have to. He didn't need us for anything. He doesn't need us to work for him. He doesn't need us to serve him. He created us out of his own divine love and desire for us to exist. Not because we had did anything good, because of his own love. And when we went astray and spit in the face of the one who made us, he sacrificed himself by taking on the form of a man and died and took on himself the punishment for our sin because we were dead in our sin. And that sacrifice made us alive again. You know your thoughts. You know your intents of the heart. You might fool the whole world, but you can't fool God. The good news is, the good news is, the sacrifice has been paid. The good news, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You know you need a Savior. You know you have sinned in deed and in thought, and you need salvation. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Don't be fooled by thinking that you can be saved by your good works, which Paul calls filthy rags. And that's kind of a polite way as I understand the translation. Filthy rags compared to a perfect, sinless God. And equally dangerous, don't be so condemned by letting Satan focus you on you. Because your salvation doesn't rest on your goodness. Focus on what is beautiful. Focus on what is pure. Focus on what is love. And God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Focus on that God. Focus on that love. Focus on that salvation. It's good news. With that. Now... I don't know where you're at in your journey, in your walk in life, in your Christian journey. Maybe you're just starting. If you've never given your life to Christ, what are you waiting for? A God that beautiful, a God that loving? How could you not want to give your life in service to that God? And maybe you need to refocus on God. Here's what I will say. I don't know you and I don't know your circumstances, but I know That it's always good to focus on God. We all lose focus from time to time, but it's always the right answer to turn to God. It's always good to focus on God. Thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.